What kind of supplements should you take when you're 70 years old? How much strength training is too much? These are some of the topics we're going to discuss in this Q&A episode. If you want to ask me a question in the future, then make sure you follow me on Instagram where I do those Q&As regularly. All right, the first question is best supplements for a 70 year old. NMN, creatine, glycine, fish oil, anything else crucially beneficial. So uh, you did hit a few of the supplements that I would certainly take if I were to be 70 years old. And uh, they are, let's say, you know, NMN is something for sure because your, let's say, natural energy levels do start to decline already in your like 40s. And uh, I I would personally think that even like, yeah, starting you in your 40s, you could start to take NMN or nicotinamide riboside. It doesn't really matter uh, pretty much on a daily basis to support the NAD like increasing the NAD levels and maintaining them. Of course, if you're younger than that, then you could also already take NMN on and off. I think that it's not needed at that age yet. You know, you can take niacinamide, which is a much cheaper and uh, another pathway for recycling NAD. So you can take niacinamide uh, for that sake. And uh, in your, But in your 70s, let's say your uh, natural NAD levels will be already pretty low and it might not be enough to support that uh, with only like the recycling pathway so in that sense you could take like 1000 milligrams of nmn on a daily basis now the issue with the taking nmn is that it does deplete your methyl donors as well so if you are taking any of these nad boosters then you want to uh, counteract some of the methyl donor loss with uh, taking uh, tmg so trimethylglycine is kind of the best uh, methyl donor for that and uh, 1000 milligrams of trimethylglycine first of all it's also going to reduce your homocysteine levels and it might have some athletic performance benefits as well for muscle strength but the you know if you're taking nmn then you certainly would need to take 1000 milligrams of trimethylglycine as well the second supplement that you mentioned uh, creatine Uh, yes i think creatine is very beneficial for anti-aging especially with regard to the fact that your muscle strength and muscle mass especially muscle power decrease with age as well so you know from a physical side you lose muscle strength muscle mass yes and you become like slower overall but the biggest and the most significant loss happens with muscle power so you're less able like how many 70 year olds have you seen that are able to do like a vertical jump (laughs) like I've, i've never seen like a 70 year old who's able to jump off the ground and that's a huge issue because yeah like the biggest loss with aging occurs in your fast twitch muscle fibers so being able to grab things being able to catch yourself if you fall and being able to yeah like jump or whatever that's a pretty crucial skill and ability for longevity and you know usually or in a lot of cases you know you don't die necessarily to a lack of muscle mass you die because you fall off the stairs or you break a hip or something else because you weren't able you weren't quick enough to catch yourself so maintaining fast twitch muscle fibers is much more important than muscle mass and muscle strength even as well in a lot of ways because yeah the ability to react and ability to be quick being able to be fast is uh much more important in a lot of uh scenarios and in a like life or death scenario that's gonna pretty much save your life in other ways so you do need to train your fast twitch muscle fibers uh for the anti-aging benefits and uh, the older you get the more important it is and if you're young then you do need to train your fast twitch muscle fibers like do like plyometrics do weightlifting olympic weightlifting do sprints and those kind of things many people neglect it like if you're just building mass and strength then uh, it's not enough you do need to like specific speed work and um plyometric explosive work you definitely need to do that as well and creatine is actually the biggest benefit of creatine isn't the muscle mass like creatine doesn't really make you build muscle tissue like you hold on to water and that increases the like lean tissue like water inside the lean tissue but uh yeah like the muscle strength and the muscle power is the biggest benefit of creatine so that's why yes creatine is a massive anti-aging supplement and uh besides that creatine also has cognitive benefits so it slows down brain aging it helps the brain energy production and it also like supports methylation it Uh, even bone density there's there's some data about that so yeah creatine is a longevity supplement and even then besides that creatine also reduces your sleep demand because of the brain benefits for and uh, yeah I, i think like everyone pretty much of all ages would benefit from taking creatine but especially if you're 70 years old and so that's something to definitely i would add to my stack glycine and nac i would put there as well because the glynac combo has been uh, repeatedly shown in human clinical trials 
in the elderly people, especially that it uh, reduces the hallmarks of aging and uh, improves muscle, let's say, function, uh, brain function, reduces inflammation, oxidative stress, and boosts glutathione, glutathione levels. So with age, you see a decrease in glutathione levels, and the glynac combo, glycine plus NAC, is perfect uh, for counteracting that. And, uh, you know, there's I don't, I don't know necessarily if the glynac is needed if you're younger, but uh, it certainly is very p- powerful if you're 70 or even like 50, 40. I, th- I take glycine and NAC regularly. I think there are benefits even if you're younger. But especially there's a lot like the studies showing the longevity benefits of glynac are usually done in uh, the elderly people uh, who benefited from the most. Next supplement, fish oil. I think that fish oil, you know, Fish oil is a bit controversial. On the one hand, there's a lot of data about omega-3s and fish oil that it is very like, you know, it's associated with reduced cardiovascular disease and reduced mortality and reduced Alzheimer's and things like that because of the EPA and DHA. And on the other hand, most of the fish oil out there is just garbage and it's like bad quality and oxidized and uh, rancid, which can like raise inflammation. But I think we have to like, yeah, look at the totality of evidence. If there is just so much data showing that even, even if they, even if all the fish oil out there is like bad quality and uh, inflammatory, even then it appears that the benefits of fish oil outweigh the potential harm. So I'm not taking fish oil, but based on the data, it appears that it's a net positive that all the benefits that you get from fish oil and the omega threes appear to outweigh the potential downside. Now, I don't think that the fish oil is the best option. There are some uh, safer alternatives that uh, you can get all the benefits without or less of the side effects. So it's less potentially uh, inflammatory and uh, rancid. So like krill oil is a good one for that or cord liver oil. And uh, you always want to choose a product that comes in a dark bottle and uh, it's not like see-through because if it is exposed to heat and sunlight or oxygen, then it is uh, going to like oxidize quite rapidly and uh, that's why like the krill oil generally is a bit like like more protected against that because of the it has like more of this astaxanthin in it that uh, is uh, protecting against the oxidation so yeah i think some omega-3 supplement is worthwhile generally i think that yeah fish is kind of the best source uh, but uh, if you want to uh, like use something to additional if you don't eat a lot of fish for example then you definitely would maybe benefit from like cord liver oil or krill oil and there are like some specific like non-oil based omega-3 supplements as well that you could use uh, to uh, get the omega-3s and uh, especially DHA and EPA. This episode is brought to you by Alitura Naturals. Alitura brings you the best natural skincare products for radiating skin and anti-aging. Regular skincare products are full of ingredients and fillers that actually cause more harm than good. Alitura uses only active ingredients sourced and handcrafted in Hawaii. Their products contain zero fillers. The Alitura Night Cream received the 2021 Clean Cert Beauty Awards for Best Face Cream. Alitura also has skin moisturizers, clay mask, serums and cleansers. Head over to alitura.com and use the code SIM, S-I-I-M, for a 20% discount. What are some other supplements that I would add in there if I were the 70-year-olds? I think uh, melatonin is something that you should also take pretty much regularly, starting around like 60 or 70 for sure, because natural melatonin production decreases with age. And uh, the issue with that is that you yes you're gonna sleep a bit worse you're gonna sleep shorter like the elderly is a pretty common trend for older people to sleep shorter which is isn't not isn't it has nothing to do with the fact that they're older it just has to do with the fact that with age your melatonin production decreases and it's not a good thing it's actually a very bad thing that you sleep shorter and uh, it's going to also compound it's going to accelerate the aging if you're sleeping shorter and you're not producing that much melatonin because the quality of a sleep is uh, very much linked to the amount of melatonin you produce at night, especially in terms of the anti-aging benefits of melatonin. So melatonin is a huge antioxidant. It has many anti-inflammatory benefits. It helps with the immune system, autophagy, and it pretty much regulates all the longevity pathways inside your body in your sleep as well. And if you're not producing enough melatonin because of age or because of sleeping under artificial lights, for example, then uh, yeah, the quality of your sleep or the anti-aging benefits of your sleep are going to be much smaller. 
But if you're older, it doesn't matter if you sleep in a pitch black darkness, you're still going to produce a bit less melatonin because of damage to the circadian clocks and the pineal gland in your brain, which uh, will make you produce less melatonin. And uh, there's also like damage to the retina that happens with age that uh, will also like blunt some of the circadian signaling that uh, is vital for energy production as well as melatonin production. So supplementing some melatonin, you know, is, is, is definitely worthwhile in your 70s. And uh, you take it like pretty much every day. That's what, what I'm going to do if I, I get to 70s. You know, naturally you want to maybe uh, take, if you're younger, you want to take like 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams of melatonin, a smaller dose. But if you're 70 or above, then I would take, yeah, one to three milligrams because, you know, you need something to counteract some of the uh, loss of a natural melatonin production. Are there any other supplements that I would add for someone who is 70 years old? Yes, there are pretty much a whole lot of supplements that you could take, like collagen peptides for the skin health redu reduction in skin aging. And also there was a recent 2023 study that showed Collagen peptides also improve cardiovascular disease risk, uh, mar the markers for cardiovascular disease. So it is longevity supplement in a lot of ways. And of course, the bone health, the joint health, like collagen is going to be beneficial for a lot of things that happen with aging and glucosamine the same way. It's going to pretty much support the cartilage and, you know, can mitigate some of the uh, like pain that uh, you could experience if you are uh, someone who's older. All right, next question. At what level of strength do you think weights do more harm than good to the joints? So I think, uh, you know, that depends a lot when you start to feel the pain. <laughs> like, you know, chances are, or if you're, if you're someone who does exercise properly, you don't get injured, you don't unnecessarily push yourself too far, and you, you practice good form, then I think the the ceiling is quite high like i personally have worked out for yeah 10 years or something like that i've never injured myself i've never had any chronic like i've never even like tweaked the back or anything like that um of course i do experience soreness and stuff like that but uh, it's very short term it's because of training hard but i've never like literally injured myself and still i'm pretty strong i'm like, like i'm not like an elite power lifter or anything like that. Um, if you look at like the strength standards, then I'm in like the advanced uh, range. I'm not an elite lifter, but I'm certainly like advanced and uh, I'm still able to keep going. Like there's no reason for me to stop uh, because like, why would I stop if I don't have any injuries? <laughs> like the, the benefits of strength training compound the longer you do it. And of course, the most important variable is being able to do it for as long as possible. If you look at people who are in their 70s and 80s, and they have done lifelong strength training, then uh, they're almost like a different species compared to a 70-year-old who uh, hasn't trained at all. Like the 70-year-old who hasn't trained at all, they're already sarcopenic, they're already frail, they're already very slow with their movement, and, you know, they're dysfunctional in a lot of ways. They're not able to, you know, act independently with their movements. They're not able to, you know, roam around the world independently because of la lacking the muscle strength and muscle mass and muscle speed and of course the bone density is also like they become more frail and if they fall then they might break a hip and actually die quite fast whereas someone who has done strength training all their life then uh, they're like a different species in a lot of ways they're they're mobile they're able to walk around very fast they're able to, even if they fall because their bone density is so high they will probably just you know shrug it off they're not going to even potentially break a hip or anything uh, so there's a huge difference between lifelong strength training and someone who doesn't train at all so you want to make sure that you are able to maintain the strength training for as long as possible so you don't necessarily need to reach obviously you don't need to reach this elite level with your strength or something like that but you do want to just maintain it for consistently and it depends on your goals if you don't want to become like an elite powerlifter then you don't need to uh, like aspire towards it either you just want to maintain a relatively like intermediate strength standards like i think intermediate levels you can look it up online intermediate strength standards are already you're going to be pretty much maxing out all the health benefits that you get from lifting weights will you get additional benefits if you're like becoming advanced or elite maybe but the issue is that if you become elite level with your strength standards then the the risk of getting injured could increase as well but again, if you're doing it like properly, if you're training properly, you always practice good form, you recover properly, 
then even then I don't think that it's going to have any like negative side effects. So the key here is getting injured. <laughs> I mean, if in the gym, the regular person, they're going to get injured already at the beginner level. If they practice poor form, they just do like bad exercises or they just like overly enthusiastically load the bar with too much weight. They're going to get injured and uh, they're going to stop lifting already at the beginner level. <laughs> so in that scenario, it's already too much for them and uh, it's harmful. So the key is, yeah, you first have to just learn the techniques, practice good form, stay consistent, follow a good workout routine. You don't need to go all out all days of the week. You don't need to go out even the entire year. Like structuring your workout program goes through like different periods of higher intensity, lower intensity, uh, heavier weights, lighter weights. So if you have a good workout plan that you can follow throughout the entire year, then you're never going to get injured. You're always going to keep making progress you know, of course, the progress slows down, the more advanced you get. But uh, yeah, like there's literally no like, I don't think there's a threshold uh, that uh, yeah, maybe like elite level is something that is probably a bit too much because it just takes a lot of effort to get to the elite level, and a lot of like focus and dedication. Uh, but if you are able to stay in the elite level and kind of maintain it without getting injured, then I think you're even going to be better off like the elite lifter who doesn't get injured will certainly be healthier and better off than the beginner who gets injured if that you, if that if that makes sense so the the how much you lift or how strong you are is uh, subjective or it doesn't matter what matters more is uh, whether you get injured or not next question how to compensate for poor sleep when building muscle and working until midnight so uh, yes like not being able to sleep well or sleeping too short will certainly um, slow down your gains you're gonna build less muscle you're gonna recover worse you're gonna be less stronger you're gonna be weaker you're gonna be more tired and yeah the progress in building muscle and strength is gonna be much harder if you don't have a proper sleep schedule and uh, you don't sleep long enough and the issue is also that you actually start to like it's much easier to maintain the fat and lose muscle tissue so if you are let's say sleep five hours then you burn substantially more muscle tissue and less fat compared to sleeping eight hours and if you sleep eight hours then yeah you're going to maintain most of the muscle and burn the fat so you want to yeah, make sure that you get at least seven to eight hours even if you're like pushing it really hard you can even aim for like nine hours of sleep uh, per night on some of the, like the harder training days and it's gonna actually improve your recovery and the gains that you get if you are working until midnight i mean like working until midnight isn't that bad like uh, optimally you want to be in bed and sleep before midnight for the circadian rhythm benefits but like midnight isn't that bad and uh, you can easily make up for it by like maybe you know taking a nap in the afternoon or something like that to practice some siesta sleep that uh, you catch up on some of the lost sleep and uh, you still maintain some of the like vigilance and uh, recovery side with a short nap like a 30 minute nap in the afternoon is pretty good uh, what i do recommend is that in the morning you still get exposed to like the natural sunlight and try to wake up still relatively early so you, even if you go to bed at like 2 a.m then you want to wake up you know still around 8 a.m or 9 a.m you don't want to sleep until like 10 a.m or something because the morning sunlight is going to be quite crucial for actually making sure that you sleep at night so it's kind of a vicious cycle if you go to bed too late then you wake up too late and then you you're not tired enough to fall asleep at night and the vicious cycle kind of continues and at some point you're gonna find yourself in a situation where you go to bed at 4 a.m <laughs> which isn't certainly optimal so you do want to you know even if you do like go to bed too late then you want to wake up relatively early the next day and uh you know you're gonna be tired yes for the entire day you could take a short nap but you don't want to be like you don't want to be uh, like um you still want to get tired before you go to bed at the right time the next day some other supplements that you can do or take uh, to counteract some of the sleep loss is creatine so creatine is actually very beneficial for mitigating some of the you know harmful effects on the brain and you're gonna still maintain uh, like some aspects of higher vigilance and the creatine yeah, does like reduce the sleep demand as well there are other supplements like nmn and these nad boosters that are very beneficial for the circadian rhythm optimization and uh, also reducing the sleep demand i've noticed if i take nmn then i uh, just feel more energized and i don't need that much sleep of course all these different kinds of anti-inflammatory supplements like turmeric vitamin c uh, even like even like resveratrol or uh, I mean, like a microdose aspirin can also be uh, pretty good. It depends on 
depends on yeah like how um worn out you feel if you're like completely trashed you've got only two hours of sleep then i would take like the aspirin and turmeric and vitamin c and those kind of like larger dose of anti-inflammatories if you only slept like six hours then you don't need like some larger anti-inflammatories maybe even like a cold shower (laughs) could do for it and then you take a nap afterwards and that should uh, fix it so yeah that's that's generally the the advice and uh, from a diet side then if you are ever experiencing sleep loss then it's better to stay lower carb for the next day because your insulin sensitivity is decreased after a bad night's sleep and you're slightly more insulin resistant so uh, it doesn't it's not recommended to eat like a massive carb meal after a bad night's sleep you want to keep the glycemic control uh, or you want to control your glycemia a bit more uh, after a bad night's sleep next question how much glucosamine to take daily and should the doses be split so glucosamine yeah i mentioned it uh, previously it's a supplement that is beneficial for the cartilage and joints and it does appear to improve uh, symptoms of uh, osteoarthritis and pain so if you don't have the pain then i think it's still worthwhile to take glucosamine as like a preventive supplement i take glucosamine every day because yeah it does improve the cartilage and uh, the joint function and uh, there's even even studies finding that the glucosamine use is associated with uh, reduced mortality and uh, glucosamine is an anti-inflammatory it's an autophagy regulator so i think even if you don't have any joint pain and if you're even if you're young in your 20s i think it's still worthwhile to take glucosamine that's what i do at the dosage uh, the dosage uh, appears that the larger dosage is better so up to like three grams is what i take and uh, yeah like a lot of the benefits you start to see in the larger doses so at least 1.5 1.5 to 3 grams is what you need as a minimum should you take multiple doses um, i take only once a day three grams if you do have let's say some if you're older and you have already existing pain then uh, you could take like three grams twice a day but i don't think that uh, any more than that is needed so, like you don't need to split it into like 500 milligram doses you can just take one to five to three grams once or twice a day depending on like your symptoms i take it uh, just the once a day in the morning next question how to raise constantly too low body temperature so that's an interesting question like in the longevity space there's um some contradicting opinions about this on the one hand people say that lower body temperature is beneficial for longevity because you're pretty much like wearing your system out less like if you have a too high metabolic rate your heart is racing all the time your you know faster body temperature means that your uh, metabolic rate is faster your heart is beating faster as well so that can like cause more oxidative stress to the mitochondria and wear you out quote unquote and accelerate aging on the other hand keeping your body temperature lower can be beneficial for longevity because you're like slower like hibernating almost and your metabolism is slower which then means that you know you cause less oxidative stress over your course of your entire lifetime i think that you know there's issues with the low metabolic rate for sure like if you have too low metabolic rate and your body temperature is too low all the time then that can uh, predispose you to a lot of the negative side effects of having a low metabolic rate such as weight gain low thyroid and if you have low thyroid then your cholesterol is going to increase and uh, your oxygenation decreases so you may get like this slight aspects of neuropathy like in your hands and fingers like your hands and fingers are cold uh, all the time and uh, you feel like frail your skin is gonna uh, you know uh, scrub off and stuff like that you're gonna get hair hair loss <laughs> so if you have chronically low metabolic rate and low temperature then uh, over time yeah you might gain weight and raise your cholesterol levels which can be somewhat uh, bad like for sure like even just the weight loss or the weight gain can be problematic you're going to have like this stubborn uh, weight loss stubborn weight that you can't seem to lose so for sure you want to like raise your metabolic rate at least to like a normal range at least like most of the time and uh, carbohydrates um, i mean the biggest most effective way to raise your thyroid and your metabolic rate is to just eat carbohydrates i know carbohydrates get a lot of like bad repetition uh, but carbohydrates certainly have a huge boost on your leptin levels your metabolic rate your thyroid function and uh yeah i mean if you don't have diabetes then you don't need to be afraid of carbohydrates and uh of course if you let's say have too high metabolic rate then you can also experience some symptoms of like negative side effects from that like some autoimmune issues can uh, uh, like rise up from that so you need to be just paying attention to your like symptoms but if you have the low thyroid you have low body temperature all the time you're cold all the time then eating more carbohydrates eating more calories is gonna be the biggest like boost for that fats 
like fat has a very low thermic effect and fat also, fat also has a very low effect on your leptin, uh, the carbohydrates and insulin, spiking your insulin is actually the biggest thing that's just going to raise your T3, the thyroid hormone. And just having more carbohydrates, maybe doing less time restricted eating and certainly having carbohydrates with every meal, uh, like whole, whole food carbohydrates and fruits, that's just going to raise your metabolic rate and have some protein with that as well. And it's going to just heat up your body like nothing else, just to have some like protein with uh, whole food carbohydrates and some fruits. And uh, that should like over time, of course, over the course of multiple weeks, that's going to raise your body temperature and thyroid, thyroid function as well. And what you actually notice is that because of the higher metabolic rate and because of the higher thyroid function, weight loss becomes much easier. Like that's what I've noticed in the past. I did more slightly more lower carb intake but over the past two or three years maybe two years of uh, just eating like a, a lot more carbohydrates and i'm actually leaner <laughs> and i'm actually uh yeah i just have better metabolism and uh, better body composition as well so if you think that carbohydrates make, make you fat then uh it's not really the case granted that you don't overeat the calories the the boost in your metabolic rate is gonna be uh, making up for even if you eat like a little bit more calories from the carbohydrates just the higher metabolic rate that you experience will make you still burn through a lot of those uh, calories next question what brand of collagen do you recommend so the collagen i'm using is uh, do not age because it's uh, collagen peptides hydrolyzed collagen peptides and low molecular weight so this is the one that is on based on the studies that does improve at least the skin wrinkles and skin elasticity and the skin thickness. So uh, yeah, you, if you are choosing, it doesn't have to be do not age, but make sure that it's hydrolyzed collagen peptides, collagen peptides being the smaller molecules that able to reach the tissues and more, more absorbed more easily. And the low molecular weight appears to also be kind of uh, important uh, for that. Now do not age doesn't have like vitamin C in their uh, collagen supplement, which uh, of course optimally you would want to take some like 50 milligrams of vitamin C or 100 milligrams of vitamin C with your collagen peptides as well, because the vitamin C is what like the catalyst for the uh, collagen synthesis and activating the collagen synthesis. So you get the collagen peptides as a precursor and vitamin C is something that uh, is like needed to also like activate, activate the synthesis. But the reason uh, it's fine, in my opinion, is that you get vitamin C from pretty much almost all the foods and uh, you don't necessarily need to like uh, supplement extra vitamin C. But uh, yeah, there are different supplements out there that also have the vitamin C inside the collagen peptides. So that would be maybe like the best uh, option. And the last question of the Q&A is TRT in longevity aspect. So TRT, uh, testosterone replacement therapy, I think that uh, for sure it has a massive benefit for health span, which means being healthy for longer and maintaining functionality. So being independent, something, something similar that we talked about in the beginning of the episode that, you know, being able to walk around and catch yourself. So if you have higher testosterone levels, chances are you have a bit higher muscle mass, muscle strength as well, especially if you combine it with uh, resistance training. Now, when should you start TRT? Uh, I think I mean like naturally the male's testosterone levels uh, start to decline at uh, 40 years of age that's where you start to see like the first significant like natural declines um, but I think that if you could wait until like 45 or so 50 maybe uh, I personally would maybe consider starting the TRT maybe if I'm 50 years old uh, I don't think I don't, I don't see a reason why you would uh, need to take it beforehand because you know once you start you pretty much need to continue on otherwise because the issue is like when you start taking TRT you inject it nat artificially then your natural testosterone production will uh, decrease so you're kind of dependent of uh, the uh, injection to maintain the testosterone levels that you have if you take TRT and then you stop then you end up in a situation where you um, find yourself at a very low testosterone level because your body has to reboot its natural testosterone production and it takes a bit of time for that rebooting to happen if you've taken like anabolic steroids like a bodybuilder or something then uh, it takes even like a lo lot longer time and it might be in a situation that you, you you might not even resume the normal production of testosterone because you took so so large doses as uh you abused the larger doses so it might not you might not even able to return to like a normal testosterone level and then you're forced to start trt but uh, if you just take you know, smaller doses like in the therapeutic ranges with the trt then yeah there is still some decrease in the natural testosterone production so uh once you start, you pretty much need to commit to it for a long time. So that's why I don't, I don't think that it's kind of uh, worthwhile to start any sooner than your 40s. 
Uh, I think I'll start maybe like 45 or 50s because I do want to maintain like quality of life from a like lifespan side. There's no reason to think that uh, moderate therapeutic doses of testosterone will shorten your lifespan um, because the other alternative is being low testosterone, uh, which uh, does increase your you know risk of cardiovascular disease, risk of diabetes and risk of Alzheimer's and risk of obesity. If you have low testosterone, then yeah, you, you might just get some of the chronic diseases. So uh, it's it's net positive to take the TRT, even if it maybe cuts your life maybe five or ten years. It's still a net positive in terms of the quality of life and uh, making sure that you don't get any of the chronic diseases that many of the uh, natural men, regular men get in their 70s or 80s. If you are someone who is in their 30s or 20s even and they ha you have low testosterone, so you're like literally hypogonadal, your doctor says you're so low in testosterone that we should start with TRT then uh, yeah it depends on why you have that i would first obviously look at the lifestyle are you sleeping enough what's your diet are you too low body fat um, is there something else that is uh, reducing your natural testosterone levels some people have like yeah just genetic issues that keep them very low testosterone so yeah you could even start yeah like in your 30s or 20s if your doctor says so like i wouldn't <laughs> start injecting yourself with uh, trt uh without like a doctor because yeah like you make sure that you get the quality um ingredients quality injections and uh making sure that you first like uh, cover all the loopholes the pot potential uh, loopholes of what why you might have uh, low testosterone but naturally i think yeah every man should start to consider maybe some uh, hormone replacement therapy or trt in their 40s uh and uh you know ideally in your 50s if you're like super healthy like if you're super healthy and fit then you might not need trt until you're 50 years old so there you have it this is the q a if you want to ask me a question in the future then follow me on instagram it's at seamlund other than that thanks for watching this video make sure you click a like subscribe notification bell as well my name is seam stay optimized stay empowered